very excited to be here. <laughs> I can't imagine a session like this ever occurring in North America. So when I, when I, I read the, about this session occurring, I knew I just had to be here. The, um, I'm working in collaboration with a skateboarder and artist. Um, I think you'd be even more excited to be here, but it is a, a very long way to come. The, um, my, prin my principal collaborator, which I'll refer to several times, is named uh, Bruce Emmett. Um, there's uh, I have several slides. Some of them have, or several of them have uh, images of skateboarders in a skate park in the background. Those all come from the skateboard park that we're investigating, we're studying. That's in uh, West Vancouver, um, Canada, and all the photos date to about 1977. In 1977, a skateboard park was constructed in the community of West Vancouver, Canada. It was the first skateboard park built in Canada, among the first in North America, and although now buried, is one of the oldest remaining skateboard parks in the world. The park was advocated and designed by some of the major players in the skateboard industry. The construction was filmed and media reported on opening day events. The park was skated by a wide, wide range of people, including those who would go on to become some of the earliest professional skateboarders. The popularity of the skateboard park waned and the park was deliberately covered with about two meters of fill in 1984. The park has become, some, has become something of an urban legend or myth, so much so that a couple of years ago a fake media story appeared on the park uh, about people discovering it, excavating it, and skating it again. My collaborator refers to this as a hoaxcavation. <laughs> I, along with a variety of others from the skateboarding and art worlds, have been trying to do some archaeology at this skateboard park, but we face opposition from the landowners, which is a local school district. My principal collaborator, Bruce Emmett, a skateboarder, artist, and educator, tackled the history of the skateboard park as part of his master's work in art. He has been skateboarding for more than 30 years. The skateboard park is known by many names. The most official is the Inglewood Mill Skateboard Park. The most common name is the West Van Skate Park. In this presentation, I provide some background on our archaeological project associated with this park, describe the significance of the park, outline what we think archaeologists can learn from skateboarders, discuss the resistance we've been getting to do some archaeology here, and we describe what's next, what we hope to accomplish. I came to this project rather late. I've been directing a wide range of field projects over the last 30 years and wasn't looking for anything new, but things changed about 3 a.m. one morning in, uh, in 2013, three years ago. It was then that I received an email from someone I did not know but would eventually become my collaborator. The email invited me to become involved in this archaeological adventure um, into the world of skateboarding, art, and archaeology. I happened to be at my computer that morning at 3 a.m. working on something else, and that, but I was immediately hooked by the prospect of collaborating with skateboarders and artists. Um, so I immediately you know, hopped on board. There was no question. The abstract of this presentation mentions a wide-eyed archaeologist becoming immer immersed in the culture of skateboarding and discovering a level of intellectual engagement in an activity often perceived to be reserved for pumpkin parking lots. That wide-eyed archaeologist is me. I'm not a skateboarder, which is probably obvious. I do have a slight connection to skateboarding through my kids, though. About 10 days ago, I mentioned to one of my adult kids that I would be presenting on the skateboard project at these meetings, and the conversation turned to some of his own skateboarding exploits. My favorite relates to a time a few years ago in a resort area within the mountains of Western Canada. He was living there, skateboarding in the warm months, snowboarding in the cold, and working when necessary. As he tells it, he was barely awake one morning about 7 a.m. as he was skateboarding to work along a concrete pathway through a forested part of the resort when he hit a large black bear. Neither the bear nor my son apparently were paying attention. He described it as like hitting a brick wall. My son, my son ended up in the nearby hedges. The bear walked away. So did my son. The principal takeaway for me on this, as it relates to what archaeologists can learn from skateboarders, is that like skateboarders, archaeologists should not operate equipment or even be out without being fully caffeinated. <laughs> There are about a dozen people who are collectively interested in and are collaborating on this project. Mostly they come from the world of skateboarding and art. I am the only archaeologist. 
Most of the collaboration has been restricted to meetings between just my, my principal collaborator, Bruce, and I. These meetings always take place at a pub, usually associated with small craft breweries. So far, our meetings have taken place in five different cities, and I figure we've each sampled at least 20 different kinds of beer during these meetings. Bruce is most fond of bright citra hopped IPA. My, prefer my own preferences lean towards the darker varieties. There hasn't been much in the way of archaeological interest in skateboarding or skate parks, or as we are now calling it, skate parkology in North America. We think we are pioneering the archaeology of skate parks there, maybe in the world, we don't know. There is also apparently general interest, little general interest or appreciation of skate park heritage in North America overall, outside of or beyond the skateboarders themselves. One notable exception is a skateboard park in the, in the US. In 2013, it was listed on the United States Register of Historic Places, but that didn't uh, work very well because the, the skate park was still destroyed in 2015. We have several objectives for this project. The order of priority seems to be continually in flux, depending on whom we're talking to and probably how many beers we've been drinking. I can summarize the objectives into five major categories. Preservation, quite simply, we want the site preserved. We're worried that the school board might destroy it. We want recognition of significance. We want the site recognized as having a very high level of significance in a number of categories, which I'll talk about later. Education, we envision involving the public, uh, high school teachers that are associated with the school grounds, as well as the students from that high school, as well as university students. Archaeology as art. We hope to be able to have an excavation co-directed myself, the archaeologist overseeing the technical aspects of the project, and Bruce, uh, for lack of a better term, the creative director. We envision the excavation as a public art project. We've been talking about archaeology as performance, excavation under glass, and backlighting the trenches. We also want to make the skate park skatable again. A full-scale excavation, re-exposing the entire skateboard park, which people can skate once, once again, is amongst our objectives. Even if re-exposing the skate park is only temporary. We view the skate park as a usable, ready-made sculpture, an interactive piece that can be skated. As mentioned in my opening comments, the skateboard park of our primary concern is located in West Vancouver, Canada. West Vancouver is mostly white, wealthy, and conservative, which is important to our story of resistance, which I'll get to shortly. The skateboard park is buried under a few meters of soil. The rim may have been jackhammered, but most of the archival records we have seen suggest the rest of the park is likely unaltered. In fact, records at the time of burial suggest that should skateboarding regain popularity again, the fill could easily be removed and the park could become skatable again. The park was designed for beginners, with mellow transitions and low walls, including a, snake, a dual snake run with side-by-side -side winding paths ending in two bowls, one four feet deep and the other six feet deep. The skateboard park opened in 1977 to throngs of ecstatic youth and suffered its demise only seven years later during one of the lowest points in skateboarding cyclical waves of popularity. The park a relic in its own time, a site for rowdy weekend bonfires, an area of skateboard to be seen. The park's legend is equals parts, parts glorious and tragic. Balancing the stories of stoked youth participation in the most radical sport in North America are the stories of burning tires rolling down its curved walls, beer bottles sm smashed at the bottom of the bowl, the park's less than smooth transition into a teenage wasteland. The site is significant in many ways. We think the site represents a unique location where we can provide physical manifestations of an important recreational activity of the 70s, particularly among youth and the teenage wasteland period of the 1980s. We also see the historical significance of this site through its link with important people involved with the design of skate, of skate parks and with amateur and professional skateboarding in the 1970s, at least in North America. This, this skateboard park helped shape skateboard culture in Canada. Some of the most influential skateboarders in the world began their careers at this park. It's a significant landmark to the era of the concrete skate park. We believe the skateboard park is or will be significant to other scientists and academics, particularly those involved in youth culture, as well as those involved in construction and industrial design. We believe the skate park to have significance to multiple groups, including but certainly not limited to skateboarders of the past and the present. Judging by the interest of people we mention a project to, we believe this site to have high public significance. It seems to have considerable interest when we tell members of the public about it. We also believe an excavation of the park will have a practical and economic value. Skateboarding has become popular again. The skateboard park is already there. 
uh, buried under soil and overlaid with grass. We think the damage to the park has probably been minimal. We think skateboarders would use the park again. There have been three kinds of archaeology associated with this park so far. Before I became involved, my collaborator, Bruce, had written a thesis essay um, on his work involving the skateboard park. He describes his work as being that of a pseudo-archaeological excavation digging through the layers of the site's history, engaging with questions around authorship and authenticity, historical accuracy and objectivity. It isn't what most of us would like to call archaeology or pseudo-archaeology, but nevertheless, he was engaging with material culture and some important questions. Bruce commissioned, uh, ground penetrating radar, uh, Bruce commissioned a ground penetrating radar firm to do some testing at the site in 2012. Although verifying the general layout of the skate park beneath the soil, there were also some ir irregularities. The GPR firm attributed these irregularities to water saturated soil. On the left there you see someone being filmed, that's uh, one of the initial uh, advocates of the park from the 1970s being filmed for a documentary on skateboard history in uh, Canada, but unfortunately that film hasn't been completed yet. Uh, the third kind of archaeology that we've been doing there, uh, doing uh, associated with the park is the collaboration primarily between Bruce and myself. This is what we do mostly in pubs. Mostly this means focusing on the skate park through the lens of archaeology, discussing such things as significance and working on proposals and research designs. To understand what archaeologists can learn from skateboarders, it is useful to consider some basics of skateboarding culture. My collaborator, the skateboarder, describes the culture. The skateboard, the baseball cap, the graffiti jacket are all items that carry secret meanings, meanings which express in code a form of resistance to the order. The skateboarder's aesthetic in many ways aligns with that of the punk generation. The punk movement arose at the same time as the second wave of skateboarding in the 70s, and to this day informs much of contemporary skateboarding's aesthetic, as skateboarders continue to question, reject, and redefine cultural values and norms. For a skateboarder, appropriation, construction, and transformation of spaces for skateboarding are intrinsic to his or her practice. The desire to break free from boundaries is the most overwhelming of impulse. Skateboarding has a set of unwritten cultural codes, but there is no official rule book. Bruce says, skateboarders have a unique way of interpreting the world. They are appropriators and users of form. They see the built environment as a playground. Bruce, my collaborator, asks, what happens to the history of a place to its dominant stories, ideologies, and mythologies when they are appropriated, subverted, reinterpreted, and superimposed with new ones? I, on the other hand, the archaeologist's answer, wow, good questions, Bruce, and an interesting way of interpreting the world. My own questions, at least initially, have included, how interesting and fun would that be, working with skateboarders and artists? <laughs> then they moved on to, how can we merge our perspectives, our passions, our interests? We have discovered at least for us, that what brings us together is art. Art is at the intersection of skateboarding and archaeology, at least for us. Um, art is the tie that binds. Another tie is punk. Bruce is closer to living punk, but doesn't identify as such. I, on the other hand, admire punk from a distance. My interaction with Bruce and other skateboarders, and a very small bit of learning about skateboard cultures, offers some reaffirmations, such as remembering to look at cultural landscapes rather than just sites and artifacts. Remembering remembering to look for appropriation of built environments, remembering a sense of play in these physical evidence far beyond toys, remembering to question, reject, and, re and redefine. Some of the other things archaeologists can learn from skateboarders include sharing the resistance to order and the desire to break free from boundaries. I've learned a little bit about creative use of language. The opening words of this title of this presentation, Never Say Last Run, is skate superstition. But, but as Bruce notes, it's real. I think he speaks from experience. Some of our meetings he's wearing, you know, bandages. <laughs> the uh, saying last run in the skateboard world apparently spells certain disaster, um, inevitably leading to injury and misery. In the context of this presentation, however, we use it to mean that despite the hurdles we, are give, we aren't giving up, we're continuing our work. Our position strengthens our resolve to excavate the park. Challenging the terrain, also in the title of the presentation, is another refrain from skateboarders. We use it here to mean skateboarders are challenging the terrain of denial and opposition to skateboarding, past and present. One way they're doing this is to bring an archaeologist on site. Previous to my becoming involved, requests for archaeology being conducted at the skateboard park were rejected. 
I imagine it was easy for the school board to deny skateboarders and artists, both groups largely viewed as outsiders and often with negative images, access to the skate park. Part of my involvement as an archaeologist in a local university is to correct that, to bring some academic legitimacy in a way the school, admators, the school administrators could perhaps understand. There are many similarities between skateboarders and archaeologists, at least as I've observed them. They like beer, they are passionate, I have found skateboarders are a bit more likely to want to disregard, to disregard rules than most archaeologists. I know though. On multiple occasions I've heard some skateboarders saying they should just go to the skateboard park under the cover of darkness with shovels and dig it up. I admit I am drawn to that approach as well, but that would likely end my career in archaeology. When I was approached to become involved with the project, I didn't hesitate to accept. The opportunity to collaborate with skateboarders and artists was too great to take a pass on. But another appeal of the project was knowing the challenges of getting permission to excavate. As I indicated earlier, the location of this skate park um, is within one of the wealthiest, whitest, and most conservative communities in Canada. It was easy to surmise that the community, the community that had the park deliberately buried to discourage teenagers from going to the area, would not support, at least initially, a project to even commemorate, let alone excavate the park. The skate park is located in a grassy area in an out-of-the-way part of the school grounds. Right there. This isn't even close to the actual school, that's just an outbuilding from the school, it's in a very large uh, school grounds, a very large school of perhaps about 3,000 students, a very, very large school grounds. This is in the far reaches of that building that I don't think it's ever used. I doubt whether most days anyone even sets foot in the area. I also doubt whether more than 1% of the student population or local residents know there is a skateboard park beneath that grass. In 2015, we submitted a formal and very detailed proposal to do some archaeology at this site with a range of options um, ranging from a one-day test excavation to a multi-year project. The reply was disheartening. Essentially, the response from the school district indicate, indicated that they saw no value in archaeology, they saw no value in skateboarding, and they, and they denied any further work on their property. We do, not, we do not know what the problem is and are left only to guess. We think that the leaders of the school district are ignorant of a lot of things, including archaeology, as well as heritage. We are troubled by what appears to be a deliberate effort to bury the past physically and metaphorically. The skateboard park was buried intentionally and the school district wants to keep it buried. They have told us it was destroyed but we don't believe them. Our own research suggests otherwise. In one, in one uh, piece of correspondence they referred to the skateboard uh, period in the 70s as a dark period of history that they didn't want to bring back. <laughs> <laughs> we, are, we are troubled in the sense that they are censoring history. It is apparent to us that they have chosen to focus on the negative aspects of the first skateboard park era and are ignoring the positive. We are beginning to uh, we're, we're, we're beginning the process of seeking heritage status for the location of the skateboard park. We are working on making an application to the Canadian government to have the skate park no nominated to the United Nations World Heritage List. We also intend on making applications for designations by federal, provincial, and city governments for heritage status. At a minimum, we would like a, a commemorative marker at the site. Ideally, we would like full recognition as an important heritage site with at least part of the park excavated. Excavation would include the art world and skateboarders. We are considering going to the media. We think media will be interested in this project, which in turn will bring broad public support and put pressure on the school district to allow this project to go forward. We think the timing for this project is good. We think there will be an increase in interest in skateboarding now that it will be recognized sport at the 2020 Olympics. I have a much larger uh, written version of this presentation. I'd be happy to send an email to anybody who's interested. Thank you.